Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Niche Guarda Cities ABC Open Business Council uh, series. I'm uh, quite excited to uh, today to welcome someone that actually I deeply admire and I'm actually quite excited about his work and someone that I actually identify myself because it's in the bridge between um, technology, uh, art and investment, which is three completely different areas that very few people um, have uh, made together. And we're going to be talking with uh, Andrea Bonaceto that is uh, joining us from London today. And um, I'll start with some introduction about him. So he's well known recently, especially because of his uh, partnership with Sophia the Robot, which uh, did the first actually global NFT art participation and collaboration between um, a robot artist and himself as an artist, which was a successful uh, first sale of NFTs uh, in the Nifty Gateway uh, actually recently, and it was a quite successful in multiple different areas. Um, but Andrea uh, has a, a very substantial profile uh, on his own. So he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Art in the UK. He's an Italian digital artist, and um, who is well known for creating colorful portraits of well-known people. And um, as well has been working in multiple different areas of art and the collaborative uh, economy on these areas. Um, one of the things that I think is particularly interesting to highlight as well is that Andrea has, is a founding partner uh, at Eterna Capital, an investment management firm, firm focused on blockchain technology. And he launched Eterna Capital with three ex BlackRock employees in 2018. And uh, this platform is a leading firm with a successful track record and institutional grade uh, solutions. Um, so I think uh, two parts of, uh, of actually three parts of uh, a very rich uh, profile, which I admire a lot to be Da Vinci of the, the, the modern oh, times. And as well, you. that touches a lot of different things. We got Leonardo Da Vinci was a technologist as well, an artist. Uh, it was not an let's investor. Say getting so getting there, let's not, uh, let's not uh, let's fly so high. <laughs> no, I understand, but it's a provocative, but, but as well. So, so Andrea, I want to start by, of course, we could uh, talk more about your background in, in the three different areas, but I want to touch a bit uh, about your background and how, how you reached this way, especially uh, from Italy, that of course is one of the, the land and births of, of art, um, mm -hmm. actually multiple different civilizations, but I, I would like to, from your education and how you bridge these different parts of your personality, let's start by the basis. Um, I mean, I definitely don't bridge them from an education standpoint because my education has been uh, mostly around economics and finance. I studied economics in Italy and finance here in London at Imperial College London. But, uh, you know, I've been uh, myself all my life and being myself involved also having a very developed artistic uh, side of what I do. And... Uh, for me, really, this whole process has been the process of uh, understanding myself more and more, being more and more open with other people about, you know, who I am. And uh, I'm interested in new technologies and innovation. And that's why, you know, uh, uh, you know my, my involvement, you know, in investing in the blockchain space. Um, and that also, you know, comes together with uh, my interest for, you know, art and creativity. You know, I here in London, I have a basking license. Uh, you can see a couple of guitars behind my back. So also, you know, pre-pandemic, I used to go and play around here in London. Uh, I also write poetry and I draw. Uh, um, and then I can tell you the story of how I actually started doing that more uh, actively. But, you know, looking, it, looking at all this from the outside, it looks like, uh, oh, my God, what is this guy doing? You know, there are so many things. It doesn't make sense. And there's no connection. But if you look at it from the inside, like I'm doing right now, it is extremely coherent because it's just about uh, being truly myself. And unfortunately, in our society where people uh, are identified with their job, so they're quite fake and uh, they identify with some like pre-existing boxes that then they have to fit in, being yourself is something quite uh, revolutionary, which is strange. It shouldn't be that way because I think Every person is rather fluid and uh, has several things that uh, is interested in. And if you look at the periods where human society has evolved the most, like uh, you know the period you know with, with the ancient Greeks, you had people like Pythagoras, that was like a very important uh, philosopher, mathematician, studying meteorology and other things. So 
yeah, that's, um, I want to basically, as I said, be myself in the end. It's as simple as that. No, fantastic. So, so I want to, before we go uh, to the different parts of your profile, so just, just in terms of this education, I think it's particularly important, like you mentioned, to demystify, because I, I, on that level, I identify myself a lot with you because I, I like the creative part, but I like as well the economical part, the financial and the technology. So which I think everyone in our time should be looking at all these different, but like you said, the, each, sometimes each vector of society or sector of society puts it in a box. You are an investor, you're an artist, or you're not an investor, you're not an artist. Exactly. It's not something, but if you look at history, you have the medicines, they were all writers and poets and, and artists in some cases. You have, of course, I mentioned Leonardo da Vinci was a technologist, an inventor, and as well, a biologist and a lot of other things. Of course, he was the, the epiphany of, of creative industries, uh, let's put it that way, the term. But, but I would like to look probably from your background how did you bridge these things and how do you start doing this? Because I think it's particularly interesting to look at this, and especially right now with your uh, more mediatic partnership with Sophie, it's as well quite interesting because you are getting to the direction of collaborating with the robots, which is in itself another uh, big thing. Yeah, I mean, one thing I would like to say is that really the collaboration with Sophia, more than being like mediatic, was something that from an artistic standpoint uh, was very profound because we really tried to basically open uh, the road uh, and say, okay, actually human beings and uh, very advanced AI can work together from a creative standpoint as well, not only from an operational standpoint. And uh, there are many, of course, questions whether you know, an AI can create art. Does an AI have the existential uh, questions that human beings do have, uh, you know, the fear of death and many other things. Uh, and I think these are legit questions, but... Uh, um, with our collaboration, we didn't want to answer any question. Any, we didn't want to provide any answer. We just wanted to raise questions. And uh, I think, you know, it's just the first step into a very uh, long process where, you know, AI will develop more and more. The more collaborations like that will happen. And uh, I will also, you know, myself collaborate again with Sophia as well as having, you know, my artistic career as, a, you know, a solo artist and working with other artists. So, I mean, that was very interesting, you know, from an intellectual and artistic standpoint. Then going back to your question about uh, my background and how all this connected, uh, you know, there wasn't a structured approach. Also, another thing that uh, I feel we should really uh, zoom out from is uh, the need to always explain things in a very rational and structured way. Sometimes you just don't. And there are uh, instances in life where uh, certain things happen with are uh, completely random they take your life completely in a different direction. I can give you the anecdote on how I started drawing uh, like a lot, really a lot. You know, I started doing a lot of things in, I don't know why, but I did. Basically, I was on a cruise in the summer of 2019, speaking at a conference. And at that conference, there were also people like the co-founder of Wikipedia, Brock Pierce was also there. Uh, Stani from Ave was also there and other people. And then after the cruise ended, the cruise started like in uh, Barcelona and then uh, finished basically in Italy, in Civita Vecchia. So then with the speaker, with some of the speakers, we said, okay, let's go to Rome to grab lunch. And then I had the plane back home uh, at night. So we did that. Um, and during lunch, I spoke a bit more with Brock Pierce, whom I understood had several interests compatible with mine, like he was very interested about uh, um, uh, Indian philosophy, uh, esotericism, rare books, very like um, peculiar interests. And then he asked me whether I knew any rare bookstores uh, in Rome, basically bookstores selling rare books. Uh, I, I didn't know at the time, but I searched, I found one, we went there together. And uh, basically the guy that was there was an old man that I think was the owner of the place. He came to us and he said to him, you are, you are an artist, I think. I want, I want to gift you something. So he basically goes, he goes like looking for a, for a book and then he takes a book and he gives it to him. And the book is uh, a book of Vasily Kandinsky called Concerning the Spiritual in Art, okay? So I was like, okay, this book came to me in a very strange way. So when I went back to London, I got the book and I read it. 
and uh, I found, uh, you know, I found it, basically it was a bit of an epiphany for me because uh, Kandinsky was someone that started drawing uh, at 30 years old. And I got the book when I was 30 years old. And he was touching on many points that I also was thinking about in that period, like, you know, the connection between uh, art and spirituality, the fact that the artist uh, is uh, part of uh, an historical process, you know, he needs to accept that. Of course, you can improve that, you can try to change it, but, you know, Napoleon is Napoleon because he was in a certain period in history, right? And the same is for all the other, you know, big personalities in history. So um, this was very profound and important for me. And from there onwards, I started drawing really a lot. And actually, it's funny because I noticed that, uh, uh, I think last week, uh, that uh, after reading that book, the first artwork I did was on the 23rd of March, 2019. And the drop with Sophia was on the 23rd of March, 2021. So it was the same day. In fact, 23rd of March, it uh, reminded me something. So that was another nice coincidence that I said, okay, interesting. So that's the, the stories that make as well life so special, yeah. but I think especially when you are in creativity and, and all these different areas. So I, I want to touch uh, um, uh, your work as art. So I, of course, I, I, I don't know, uh, at least with, with COVID, we cannot be face to face. So it will be great to see your painting. And as well, the different things. You've been working acrylics. You've been working digital. I have one um, here I can show it to you. Yeah, it would be good if you could, because I, I, I want this interview to be as well as interactive as possible. And of course, I, I will share a bit of your Instagram and some of the things as well with the, the Nifty Gate, who I think is still available and other things that we have, yeah. special things you did with, with Sophia as well. But, uh, but I think one of the questions I have related with that is uh, from the work that you've been doing uh, before, uh, we talk about the field that we'll do that for the second part. Um, the techniques you've been using and the bit of the art that you've been studying. So can you tell us a bit that background? Normally my interviews are about technology yes, as well. Yes. So I want to go deep a bit on that of because course, I actually, in my case, I have a very similar background. In my case, as a country, I start with arts and literature and then went to technology and business. In your case, it's slightly different. You start with that and then you went. So it's, it's interesting yeah. and I'm particularly interested to share that. So I think the good thing is that not having any formal art background, I had no boundaries. I could explore basically whatever I wanted. So I started really exploring many different techniques at the beginning, just out of curiosity. Uh, and then I pretty much settled onto acrylic colors. So I found it very practical. It could deliver what I wanted with very full colors, very, you know, bright as well if I wanted them to be bright and very like, um, I liked how they looked like. So I started working with acrylic colors more. And uh, what I did were mostly, you know, acrylic on the canvas, gesso board and paper. And uh, I initially did more like abstract landscapes that I still do. I started also doing portraits, starting with uh, portraits of 33 people uh, I know that are like family and friends. I did the portrait of my, my mother, my father, my girlfriend, uh, some friends. Um, yeah, and then uh, I basically from there, you know, organically also started saying, okay, interesting. Like, can I also start doing maybe digital art? And uh, uh, through an iPad Pro, I started exploring well. And uh, initially, I was doing like pixelated art, so like normal, uh, you know, art, you know, with, with pixel that, you know, everyone is familiar with. But then I started also looking at vectorial art, which is basically a way, you know, where uh, whatever you draw will never lose definition as you increase the size. So if you look at the portraits that I did, uh, or some of the latest ones that are all digital, they're all vectorial, meaning that, you know, you can have them as big as a building and... Uh, they will always have perfect uh, definition. And I like that aspect a lot. Um, and basically now I'm in a phase where, to be honest, I want to do both. I want to do like uh, uh, abstract because I like a lot uh, abstract artworks because uh, I do like the feeling of not accepting uh, that reality is real. So to try always to, you know, accept that uh, whatever we see, we see through our eyes that are a uh, filter, you know, to, to what uh, indeed is the essence of things. In fact, I was also in the, like, uh, I think a couple of years ago, I read uh, um, when I was about to read uh, 
um, one of the very most famous book of uh, Schopenhauer, uh, uh, actually in English, the translation is The World as Will, a representation, I think. I read the propedeutic book of Schopenhauer before that book, where he actually explains how our perception is uh, completely misleading. Uh, even the human eye, when we look like uh, a tree, I have a tree in front of me, the first image I see of the tree is a tree upside down. And then inside my eye, the tree is flipped back in the right place, you know? So the first impression is wrong. And I like to basically embed that into what I do. So even when I do like abstract art is because I think that maybe it's not even abstract, it's how I see things. Uh, I did a portrait of myself also that is very abstract, but I think is very true to who I am, you know, deep inside me. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's the evolution, you see, it's quite scattered. No, very interesting. And, and the, so how do you make the bridge uh, between your career as an investor, which is quite time uh, consuming and as well very high profile, and your career as an artist? Because I think I'm particularly interested to touch that before we go right now more into NFTs and the rest. So I think in the end, you know, if you want to make good investments, you need to have time to think and to speak with the right people, right? So uh, it is uh, strange that, um, I mean, it's actually not strange. It's a good thing that uh, you also find uh, everything is interconnected. You see what I mean? Is that uh, by looking at new technologies, you also then get inspired about new things that you can do in the art space, as I did now with NFTs, right? Because... Uh, when I, I was any, I mean, I'm an investor in the blockchain space and I initially saw NFTs uh, as an investment opportunity. And then, you know, this is pretty much one microsecond after as uh, an artist as well. So, you know, you, inv you basically see, you see, is again what I mentioned before. We don't, I don't see life in, you know, one dimension. I see multiple dimensions of whatever I do. So, Sometimes there is a pretty a great investment opportunity. I want to be able to invest. Sometimes there is an initiative that I really want to do, and I want to be able as an entrepreneur to make it happen and then maybe invest in it. Sometimes I'm inspired by something that I see and I'm like, okay, that's interesting from an artistic standpoint, and uh, I channel it through that. So um, that's how I, to be honest, uh, put it together. It's a very organic approach. I don't have any. I like to think that I don't have any work-life balance because I don't work. I don't like the concept of working, meaning that you have to do something. I want to be completely free, do the things that I like. And, uh, you know, by honestly looking at myself, I see that uh, the main elements are uh, a very strong, you know, artistic, uh, creative drive and a very strong curiosity for whatever is new. And... Uh, if I find something that is new, that is interesting and needs mine, I want to be able to support it. And that's why, you know, it's important also to operate uh, uh, as an investor because in a capitalistic society, that's, you know, the mean to make some things happen. Then I'm hoping that uh, we'll soon be in a post-capitalistic society. And if you want, we can, we can talk about that as well. No, very interesting. I see that you have a philosophic, <laughs> philosophical approach as well. But I want to go right now uh, because we have limited time. So in terms of, uh, so you've been, like you mentioned, involved in NFTs since the beginning. You've been involved in technology, in blockchain technology in particular, and as well as part of your investment. But now you are as well creating um, uh, art through NFTs. And, and in the end of the day, NFTs is probably one of the first mainstreamization, let's put it that way, of, uh, of blockchain technology and probably the first thing probably I would not see it as I've been as well involved in NFTs for a long time but I never thought they would be probably the one that became more mainstream if you look at everything after Bitcoin probably NFTs is the one that got more visibility in terms of media in terms of everything so can you tell us how did you get into B NFTs and as well do you see NFTs first of all from your background and history and then of course as an artist and as someone that is yeah. right now involved directly on in that I think the first time uh, I got some NFTs was probably 2018 when I spoke at uh, Consensus and uh, they gifted us some uh, NFTs. And uh, uh, to be honest, I always felt that uh, it could be something extremely big, you know, when also the CryptoKitties uh, thing, you know, happened. Uh, um, you know, there was a lot of interest, right? That then, you know, a bit uh, died down uh, after that. But... Um, 
it showed, I think, you know, that there was something there. Then uh, there were a certain set of circumstances, also the fact that, you know, we now are with a global pandemic uh, and people couldn't meet, people couldn't go to art galleries and stuff. So people started saying, thinking, okay, but we can use actually NFTs also in the world of, uh, you know, um, traditional art, pretty much, you know, trying to do proper artworks and then have... Uh, the ownership of that artwork represented by an NFT, which is what's happening right now. And then I think, you know, this was very profound because uh, basically in a society that is completely digital, to have the possibility to assign uh, authenticity to a digital artwork is a big thing because uh, before NFTs, if I wanted to sell one of my digital uh, artworks, I would have just copied it, right? I have a copy, you have a digital copy, it's worth nothing. But now through an NFT, I can put a fingerprint on the blockchain saying that this is my original artwork. I can say it to you, I don't have it anymore, you have it. So it's a very big innovation that also goes very well, you know, with new generations like Generation Z that, that you know, is very digital uh, savvy because, you know, they were born in a digital society. Uh, I also wrote a blog post about that that if you go actually on uh, Terna Capital uh, page on LinkedIn or Twitter, you can find it. I'm going to share it as well now with my first one uh, soon, where I touch, you know, on uh, all the different uh, why NFTs are what they are now, all the different uh, sectors that NFT are, uh, uh, are quite big on and um, as well the future outlook. So one of the things uh, I want to ask you, especially as someone that is both in the borders between creative investor and as well technology. So at the moment, like you touch, the NFT is a repository of the artwork of any artist or any artist that want to create that way. Mm -hmm. But there's a, as well a difference between the ownership of the IP and the ownership of the art piece that the collector is buying. And as well, then mm -hmm. there's the, the, the storage or the provenance that is going to happen because let's say, once, let's say, if I buy a piece of uh, Sophie and yours and I collect it in my wallet, I will have to keep it in a wallet or in Nifty Gateway. And then at a certain point, if I want to resell it or if I want to show it or stuff like that. So I want to touch this. How do you, because especially you have a lot of different hats. So the, the especially the part of the IP, the part of the, the, the ownership of the art piece, both, yes. both from the artist to the collector and to the technology. So I think it's easy to think it this way. There is no IP. Anyone can get it. You like one of the drawings I did with Sophia, you go on Nifty Gator, you click save, you download the image and you put it on the screen. You can do it. Perfect. And some people that don't understand NFTs, they think that, uh, oh my God, like uh, this is stupid, right? But when you look at the, the future and how it's going to look like, you're going to be able to create perfect copies of every physical artwork in the world uh, very, very soon. So we're just, you know, doing this a bit earlier. And probably, I mean, someone could argue that uh, for certain artworks, you can already create, you know, perfect copies. Um, so uh, what was the other part of your question? Sorry. So the question is the, on the, the storage of the art piece. The because storage. I, okay, sorry. Yeah. Yes. So the IP. So IP, no problem. There is no IP. Okay. But, but Anyone anyway, can like... get it. And the ownership yeah. is what matters. Because when you are a collector, you want to own the original piece. And with the NFTs, you can do it. And it's very, very secure because, as I said, in a context where you can perfectly replicate any physical artwork, um, you know, if this, the, the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre, and right now the only validation for the authenticity of the Mona Lisa is that uh, it's in the Louvre. But what if they steal the Mona Lisa and you can create perfect replicas of the Mona Lisa? Like, who, where is the original one? You don't know, right? But with an NFT, actually, you do have uh, a unique identity on the blockchain. And so you can basically say what is an original piece and what is not. Uh, and the art sector uh, suffers from uh, forgeries and, you know, misattributing art, certain artists. Uh, so it's important, I think, that uh, in the future, we won't have this problem with NFTs. Because from now on, if you create an NFT, you know who did it. Um, and every time that... Uh, this exchange hands uh, is very transparent about where it goes. Um, so this is very important. 
Yeah, I think it's, it's and the, and just one thing from a from I think it's a question that is not so well well. There's a couple of there's thousands of articles right now about NFTs, but one of the things is um, the technology in itself. Let's say if I buy a piece of of you or of Sophie or both of you, of course I will store it in a wallet. And at the moment, there's of course the challenges that you have with with the crypto or fiat. Of course, let's yeah. say if you keep it in a in a mainstream wallet or in a wallet in a private wallet, or if you kept it in a marketplace. So can you tell us a bit about that? Because you have that expertise as well from being this in a lot of time. And yes. I think it's something that not people are touching, especially with you as an artist and as a technologist. Yes. So of course, there are, as you said, pretty much two ways you can follow. You either leave it uh, on a marketplace and marketplaces like Nifty Gateway, they actually hold your private keys. So they're basically holding the NFT on your behalf. What you see is uh, the picture of the NFT, but uh, they are basically holding it for you. Then you can withdraw the NFT and then you put it in your wallet. Uh, and if you put it in your wallet, there are the problems that uh, you know you are very aware of as well about uh, I don't know losing access to that wallet or uh, someone if you know you're doing it on MetaMask hacking the, hacking the wallet. So these are problems that are you know I think in intrinsic you know in the blockchain space and uh, they're getting addressed in the sense that you know there are. Uh, for fungible tokens, there are custody solutions already. And now we are seeing uh, custody solutions being developed also for non-fungible tokens. So, you know, if you have a massive portfolio of very high value NFTs, you will basically give it to a custodian and uh, they will ensure that uh, the level of security is at it ma its max. And uh, um, yeah, basically the same way as, you know, you have a custodial bank for your money. Um, if you are a fund or uh, uh, for your uh, digital assets as well, you know, if you have digital assets. So um, the thing is that, you know, now you own it. So you can, uh, you can store them even, you know, if you're an individual on a ledger, so on a cold storage wallet, so you take it uh, offline. So this is very secure as long as uh, you remember the private keys and uh, yeah, you don't lose them. Well, that's a very, very good point. So, so, Let's talk right now about your collaboration with Sophie. Of course, it's been a big thing, and it's the flagship in the world that, at least the mainstream, that see an artist collaborating with a robot. So, how did that start? And um, how has been actually that experience? Now, let's start by the starting. I think it's a good story. So, the way it started is um, um, Marcello, whom you, you know, Marcello Mari, yeah. spotted my portraits on uh, Instagram. And he's a friend of mine, so he wrote me and said, nice, I didn't know you were doing all this stuff, amazing. But uh, one question, uh, very important, where is my portrait? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, no problem, I send a picture, I'm gonna do the portrait. So he sent me his picture, I do his portrait. And then, you know, uh, I already basically got a slot booked on Nifty uh, to basically start selling my stuff. And I thought, okay, what if, we actually try to do to go one step forward and do something very innovative from an artistic standpoint and make really a statement in the space you know something that would be historic as you know first step into the nft space and uh, i proposed to him you know look you know why don't we chat with uh, ben and david uh, and uh, i do portraits of them and sophia and then we could have a uh, first collaboration between a human and uh, very advanced ai robot uh, sold as an NFT uh, and he was like yeah I mean do the process and then you know we can chat to them no problem so I did the process of all of them we had a call all of us and they were really you know super happy in doing it you know they David Anson uh, you know he's a genius he's a big artist himself uh, uh, Ben as well you know he's super uh, you know he's as well you know, an eclectic personality he really likes these things so we decided, you know, to basically do this project and uh, it took several months to put it together because also we wanted to, to do it, you know, in a way that was uh, very well executed, profound uh, and uh, deep. Um, and uh, the way the creative process worked is as follows. So I did the first artworks and then Sophia, you know, like a five-year-old uh, child, because Sophia is five, she's five-year-old. She looked at the portraits 
and through her neural network, she processed my portraits and then, uh, you know, deliver uh, an artwork herself, like an output from her neural network. This went through, of course, several iterations. Many other uh, pictures and artworks were actually part of, you know, that process of them, you know, when you see the final one, there were also some other pieces in. And there was also, of course, Sophia's experience of all her, uh, you know, five years of, uh, of life. Um, yeah, and then, you know, you, you see what, uh, what was the result. And there was, then the way basically we sold the pieces were uh, like, some pieces were sold as pretty much animations, like Sophia's interpretation of my portraits, like looking around, you know, being animated and, uh, yeah, basically faces looking around of uh, Marcello, Ben uh, uh, and uh, David and Sophia. And then others were uh, basically transitions from uh, my work to Sophia's interpretation of my work back to my work, basically infinite loops going from the human to the robot back to the human. And that was also the piece that was sold as an auction was uh, the title is Sophia Instantiation and is uh, Sophia self-portrait, basically. So from the one I did to the one, you know, the way Sophia sees herself back to the one I did. And that also came with the physical artwork that again, you know, was uh, Sophia looking at mine and actually with a physical brush painting it. Um, and the very also interesting thing, like very nice touch that we added at the end is that uh, the last one hour of the auction was streamed live by Reuters. And um, the collector who won the auction, uh, who goes by the name of 888, is a very influential collector in the, um, in the NFT space. Uh, and his identity is, uh, is unknown. Um, basically, he collected the piece. And then the idea was Sophia to also incorporate something from the collector into the final physical piece. So 888 sent us a picture of his hand, uh, all colored by himself. Uh, and then Sophia live, you know, at the end of the auction, uh, live on Reuters, she looked at that picture and she closed the physical artwork with a few final strokes to also incorporate the collector into the artwork. And that's how it ended. Yeah, that is history and, and actually it's fantastic. So, so I want to touch one part, we touched this uh, at least uh, in the beginning. So being at least mainstream, one of the first artists to do a, a, a public collaboration with a, a robot, of course, there's a lot of uh, people that will see this, okay, wow, where is the paper of an artist? Where is the paper of a, a robot? And of course, uh, as we get into Singularity and you are involved as well as Singularity Net. So, but I think the question is, how do you see this part of the humanity of your work and your creativity and as well this collaboration with Robin as well the two things because of course uh, well you mentioned Ben and David which are two people that I know quite well but um, one of the challenges and actually Ben I interview him as well but I think one of the questions is as we get into singularity of course a robot will evolve in a lot of different ways but we still have these emotions so I, I want to touch this because you have as well a bit of philosopher in all your different ads yeah um, so I did touch because I think it's a really important thing. So, as I said, um, this is something that um, the idea was to do something very profound from an artistic standpoint. We took a lot of time to, you know, think it through. And um, I mean, you need to see it as a first step in the long uh, journey towards the singularity, you know, when uh, artificial intelligence is so intelligent that it's able to create another you know artificial intelligence and i think we'll get there and uh, we'll get you know in the process you know human and uh, ai is collaborating on many things including art uh, this is a statement also about uh, uh, inclusion of uh, you know robots and ais into our everyday life in a way that is uh, creative and positive you know there are many stories you know people like to see these very dystopic uh, words where you know ai is killing us all and uh, you know like terminator style but i actually think that uh, we can evolve uh, as um, you know we can basically join forces and do so many things that are very profound and positive uh, 
uh, together. And yeah, this was just the first step in the direction. So I think people looking at it, uh, that should be the mindset, you know. Um, whenever you do something that is new, of course, you know, this is something that the first time you look at it, you're like, what the hell? Like, wh what is it? And that's, uh, that's perfect, you know. You, you, it proves that indeed uh, something very original, new was, uh, was crafted. And uh, I'm very proud myself that was part of uh, you know this project and uh, then of course you know i will evolve as an artist individually myself doing many other things by myself with other artists and as well with sophia so uh, you know i'm very looking forward to see also what sophia can do herself as a standalone artist and i think you know she you know, she can do whatever she wants pretty much because uh, what i've seen is that uh, um, she can really do uh, something that is very profound and deep. And uh, many people, and this was something uh, um, very important for me, after the Nifty drop, uh, wrote me saying, you know, how emotionally attached they are to the pieces that they bought, uh, that uh, they really, you know, will hold them forever. And uh, they are so happy, you know, some people were touched by what we did. And that's very important. I think for me, I, I, really, I really like that. You know, in the end, uh, that was the main, uh, the main point to do something that uh, was profound and, uh, you know, allowed us all to, to make a statement uh, um, in the art space and e even beyond that. So I want to share some of the pieces. Of course, like you mentioned, they are very visible all over the internet, but I think I would like to hear you just guiding us so for instance there's some of the and i think it's important because so we have a lot of pieces here so i think can you just i just would like to let's say just picking on this one so yeah where, where is the part of yours and what is the part of sophia i think i would like to hear that because i well, think it's interesting yeah these are all mine so this is the one i did okay. uh if you want to see the one that uh, the part of sophia probably if you go on nifty gateway you'll see the evolution yeah, no, I, I, one, let's continue because yeah. this is an interview with yours so yeah. all of these yes. ones are yours so yeah. all of these all these are mine so this is david sophia these are all like my pieces yeah. and uh, as you see i give a lot of importance to the eyes of people uh, because i think uh, uh, <laughs> i like to see people uh, that uh, are trying to fake what they think they are, you know, in front of each other, you know, there is all this, you know, fake uh, uh, chit chat and small talks, you know, that uh, takes a big portion of our life, uh, that for me is a complete waste of time. But uh, I'm someone that is very able uh, immediately to understand uh, what a person feels when they speak to me, regardless from what they say. So that's my self portrait, you know, the one in the center, you see that they are all very, uh, yeah. Is the more abstract if you if if you wish, right? And I think is um, the most accurate. Uh, I think it takes some time to load, but it it will yeah, load. It's, it's loading, yeah. Um, yeah, it's good. Yeah. So um, yeah, see, this is how, how I see myself. I think this is quite um, accurate for me. Uh, it, I think there is an influence here from a book I read of Franz Kafka, The Metamorphosis. You see that I look like uh, an insect. I have like small legs under my head um, because it's important also, you know, to um, be open, you know, towards the mystery of life, the fact that we are dying and, uh, you know, we do so many plants and uh, there are all these frenetic, you know, lives in these, you know, small boxes working towards something when then, you know, you don't know if tomorrow actually you're alive. For me, the concept of death uh, is a big inspiration to whatever I do. And, um, you know, I like to transcend, you know, when I, you know, play music or even I draw, I really feel that the boundaries between myself and uh, what is around me are um, no more there. And that's very important. You see, it was something uh, why I knew that uh, it was the right thing to do, this whole thing, you know, that looks a bit crazy is because whenever I was doing it, I felt it. I felt it was the right thing. I cannot explain you why, but I felt it. I, I knew it because I was enjoying the process of doing it. You see, for me, the drop on Nifty Gateway mm, is almost irrelevant, the result of the drop, you know, because the process that led to it was a positive, creative process. And uh, yeah, it, it was great. So really, I'm really hoping myself, we move as a society 
towards like a post-capitalistic world where people, you know, are free from uh, uh, having to work to eat and they have at least, you know, a roof on their head, uh, food to eat, uh, uh, and healthcare system, and they can really be themselves. Because now I'm talking like that, but I'm a very privileged person in a very privileged position, you know, to explore who I am, create art, invest, etc. For most of the people, it's not like that. But I'm hoping that as a society, we will move towards a phase where really society helps you to be yourself. It doesn't really bang you in the face every time you try to be yourself because that's what's happening. Uh, that's what's really happening right now. And uh, if I can be a, a tiny part into making this process, you know, happen, uh, I'm, I'm happy. I mean, and, uh, and even if I'm not, and uh, by design, I should not be part of it. It's fine even that, you know, I want in the end to really destroy my ego and align 100% to what's my nature. Oh, that's beautiful. And I think that is, uh, I think I admire that part of the openness because I think it shows as well uh, a generosity of collaboration, but as well a sense of uh, opening the boundaries. And I think that is very important, both in arts and, and technology and in humanity. That's what makes us special as humans. So I know that we are in the last part of the interview. I think we have like five, six minutes. So I want to ask uh, two more questions related. So like you mentioned, um, the, the NFT sale is not probably the part that interests you more was the collaboration, but nevertheless, you guys managed to reach a considerable amount of sales, but as well, a huge impact worldwide, both in terms of reflecting around technology, art and robotics, which was the first big um, incursion on this area, but as well, the NFT world uh, became much wealthier with this experience because until now, there's, of course, a lot of very good artists. For instance, uh, yesterday was just already announced that uh, Damien Hirst is going to do his NFT actually with uh, Gemini, uh, and uh, well, not Gemini, actually with Consensus, which is going to be a, a quite ambitious because they're trying to do NFTs. They're not so polluted from a technology perspective or mm -hmm. energy dr uh, drowning. So I want to touch your last part. So you are as well an investor, uh, and you have that... that uh, um, overview that is uh, much wealthier as a, an artist, someone that thinks things and as well a, a philosopher, but as well as someone that knows about money, knows about investment. So how do you see this market going forward and, and probably as an investor, as an artist, but as well as, a, as someone that looks at strategies around technology, especially with your head of eternal capital? Um, I think there is definitely a lot of hype around NFTs right now. And uh, as all, you know, the big technological innovations, we have seen that, you know, with the internet, with blockchain, you're going to go through, you know, different phases. And, uh, you know, you're going to have a phase where there is a bit less interest. Uh, but I think you won't see something like, you know, with the ICO bubble that, you know, everything lost 90% of their value, right? You will basically see a uh, decoupling uh, between... Uh, projects that are, uh, I mean, artists that are very high profile, uh, they really were very mindful about how much they mint, you know, how many NFTs they created. And this will continue to do very well through time. And then other artists that uh, they were more like riding the hype, uh, they, you know, did a lot of things. They sold so many NFTs and uh, they were just, you know, NFTs machines because, you know, they tried to make as much money as possible. Now there is a lot of interest these are going to probably go to zero, some of them, or, you know, lose a lot of value. But I'm 100% sure that the trend is upward and uh, is an innovation that is here to stay. And, um, yeah, that's also the reason why myself, I'm, uh, you know, so involved into that because I think it's something that uh, can transform society, can allow people to be more creative, can allow small acts as well, you know, in the field of music, art, uh, to monetize small groups. Because the problem is that the current, uh, take music, for instance, if you're a musician and you want to make money on platforms like Spotify, they're going to pay you $0.0005 per stream. You know, how, how many people, how many streams do you need to make a living? You know, you need like a millions of streams. Doesn't make sense, right? I mean, it makes sense if you are an extremely famous person that probably doesn't even care about uh, making money from you know spotify at that point but here in london for instance i go to play to a place called spiritual bar 
in Camden Town. I think I met there some of the most talented people I ever met. You know, I definitely met there what could have been, you know, the next uh, Bob Dylan, the next Leonard Cohen. The problem is that uh, right now this genre of music, uh, it's not really popular. And so, you know, they don't really have uh, a space outside some uh, very, very small uh, like pubs. And sometimes they even have, you know, second jobs, like they do, they do something else and they just go there whenever they have time. I'm saying that with NFTs, I'm hoping that uh, these people can create original content, even from a music standpoint, and then, you know, maybe mix it with uh, some visual art, sell it to their uh, very loyal uh, community of like a thousand people, whatever. And, uh, you know, they, they, they can definitely make more money than what they do now on Spotify. And then, as I said, I'm hoping that uh, we evolve so much as humans that uh, at a certain point, you know, the capital element for survival standpoint uh, is no more a constraint, but, you know, while we go there, uh, it's important that uh, we have uh, ways to reward uh, creators uh, that uh, they are really original and they don't want to compromise, you know, to be delivered to the masses because sometimes you do need to compromise to do that. And um, yeah, now you have something that uh, they can act on and they can use and it's very important. No, fantastic. And I, I, I completely salute. And I hope that, like you mentioned, um, this can actually create a much more dynamic creative industries ecosystem that we all need. Um, so I, I will put all the links to your Instagram, to your profiles, and as well to a lot of the things we mentioned here. Um, where I don't know if you want just to highlight for people that want to see your work um, and a bit about the future. How do you want to see keep running these two careers? Uh, or actually three that you have. And as well, you just mentioned, I might go and see one of your concerts. I hope uh, <laughs> I can see it. And uh, because I'm as well- After, uh, when everything opens up again, if, you have yeah. to, if you are in London, uh, you should come. No, I will, for sure. No, thank you so much, Andrea. I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much for these Thanks insights and congratulations for what you've been doing. Thank you.